seminars that happen every two weeks. Uh, these uh, particular email I sent, I sent to some people in applied math, I sent to some people in biology. So if you are here for the first time, you have a look at the local systems. Uh, we this state with student uh, uh, meetings. Basically, as I said, it happens every two weeks. We, we usually have uh, graduate, graduate students speaking about what they're working on and ideas and things that they're doing. And it's pretty broad to have people from very different fields, engineering and public health. And, and basically, we have people from all sorts of departments at the university. And today we are glad to have uh, Professor Mark Newman here, who is uh, done physics. And also very advanced graduate students. Huh? A very advanced graduate yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, they, uh, and so, if you are, if you if you want to be part of the uh, CISO, as I said, you just uh, send us an email. You're gonna be added to the C tools. You're gonna receive the emails saying uh, when you have meetings and what they are for. And you can order food; it's free. You just go put your name there, and when you come, your sandwich is waiting for you. Um, we are gonna have a, we are organizing also a symposium that's gonna happen in. April 4th, 5th, so stay tuned. We're going to send some emails about that. So thanks all for coming in. We hear from Mark. Okay. How are you? Hello, everyone. So I'm going to talk about some of my work uh, on networks. Here today, I'm going to start off with some uh, fairly simple ideas and then towards the end, get onto some more complicated stuff. <coughs> Um, uh, so I work on networks of various kinds, a lot of work on social networks, but also technological networks, internet and the World Wide Web, and so forth. And I'm interested in basic mathematical models of networks and what they can tell us about the way we expect network systems to behave. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, one, of the, one of the biggest problems in the study of networks, which is that you have some big network that you measure in, uh, you know, it's the internet or something, so thousands of nodes, or the World Wide Web, and it's got billions of nodes, and you want to know something about the structure of this thing, but it's far too large to make a picture of it. You can't really get a good view of what the thing looks like, so we've developed ways for the computer to pick out the structure of the network for us. Some of that involves just sort of very simple measures, like, on average, how many friends does a person have? But some of them are more complicated measures as well, um, involving sort of the large scale structure. Here I have a big network, and how does it break down into pieces, and those pieces break down into pieces, and so forth. Um, so I'll be talking about a couple of different ideas to go in that direction today. Um, I'll be talking about uh, communities in networks. Many of the networks we look at break into uh, different groups. You have a clump here and a clump there, and maybe those clumps tell us something. Maybe there's something going on there. Why, why should we program into these two clumps? What are those two clumps? Um, so this, this is called community structure in the jargon, and I'll talk about that quite a bit. A uh, so more sophisticated version of that <coughs> is a uh, hierarchical structure where maybe you can get a network that breaks down into groups like the the red, the green, and the blue here, but then maybe if you look closer, those groups break down into other groups, different shades of red, different shades of green, and so forth. And you can have groups within groups within groups, um, which you can also represent as a sort of tree-like structure where the network breaks up into smaller and smaller groups. Uh, another example is rank structure, and this is the first one that I wanted to talk about today. This is something that I've been working on recently with uh, Brian Ball. Uh, so in this example, we have a network that breaks down into some sort of hierarchy. Some of the nodes are higher up and some of the nodes are lower down. And the place where we first uh, encountered this was uh, in looking at some uh, social networks of uh, school kids. Uh, so there was a large uh, study conducted by the NIH, uh, headed by Jim Moody at the Duke University, uh, in which they studied uh, friendship networks between kids in a large number of U.S. high schools. So they went in and they asked the kids, so who are you friends with uh, uh, in your school? 
And, uh, and from that, they constructed uh, networks of who's friends with who in about 100 different schools. One of the interesting things about these networks is that uh, if you look at them, uh, they are directed networks, meaning the friendships run in one direction. Meaning person A says in survey that person B is their friend. So you get a directed connection, A says B is their friend. And you look carefully at the network, it turns out that not all of the time B says that A is their friend as well. I mean, you'd expect them to. You know, you think friendship is being a two-way street. But actually, it turns out that it's not always the case. A says that B is their friend, and B doesn't say that A is their friend. This actually happens surprisingly often. About a half of the friendships in the network are one way only, typically. That's sort of an average figure for the networks we looked at. Well, this is a well-known phenomenon. Sociologists have observed this in studies of friendship networks for a long time, but it's typically been viewed as a problem with the data. Oh, I think friendship, you know, either these two people are friends or they're not. What we've got here is like a half of a friendship. One person says they're friends, the other person says they aren't. There's some problem here with the data. That's the way people have looked at it, and then how can we fix that problem? So a classic way of fixing it would be, let's just ignore the directions of the connections in the network. The edges of the network. We'll just say they're undirected. We'll just say if either person says that they be a friend, then we can see that. So that's a typical sort of thing people do. But we decided to look at this a different way and say, well, maybe rather than looking at it as a defect in the data, maybe this is telling us something. Maybe there is a signal hidden in the directions of the edges, the directions of the connections, and we can learn something by looking at the pattern of those directions. <coughs> So, uh, our hypothesis was uh, that, well, after thinking about this and playing around with the data for a while, we came up with a hypothesis. And the hypothesis is the following, that in the school there exists some ranking of the kids in the school from high to low, and that these directed connections, <coughs> these subset of friendships which run in only one direction, tend to point from lower ranked individual to a higher ranked individual. That's the hypothesis. The hypothesis, it turns out, is reasonably well backed up by looking at the actual data. Um, I'll talk about that in a moment. But so here's the sort of picture I'm thinking of. Here's a network which represents friendships between uh, a few of the kids in one of these schools. So the nodes, the dots, represent uh, the kids. And there are arrows representing this person said that they're friends with this other person. So the hypothesis is that I can find some way of arranging these from low to high such that when the arrows go only one way, they tend to go up. They're low rank going higher. So the obvious sort of uh, implication here is that this is some sort of social status thing. There are people lower down the pecking order, people higher up the pecking order, and the people lower down want to be friends with the cool kids who are higher up, and so they say they're friends. But the cool kids are not saying that they're friends. Um, however, you know, that's kind of what you're thinking, but all we actually see in the data is the direction to the end. There is a sort of... Uh, a sort of uh, additional implication of this conjecture, which is that if people don't like to say they're friends with people sort of lower down the pecking order than them, then when you do see pairs of people that both say they're friends with the other person, which happens often, that's about half of the friendships, so those two people must be roughly equal in rank. Because if they were different in rank, then one or other of them would have to be saying, I'm friends with somebody who's a lot further down the pecking order. And if people don't like saying that, then that's a number. They must be roughly equal in rank, otherwise one or other of them would be an arrow pointing down. So I've drawn it that way in this picture. When, when people are, have big difference in ranks, you can have a one-way connection going between them, but when they have similar ranks, they even have a two-way connection going between them. Um, so how could we determine this, rank, this ranking? Well, so if we believe that to be the case, one thing we could do is we could just get rid of all the two-way connections, right? and just look at the one-way connections only, and then we expect most of them to be going up the ranking, so then we can just say, can we find any ranking of the nodes that uh, 
makes most of the edges go in the upward direction, a few of them go in the downward direction. Well, there's a standard way of doing that called the minimum violations ranking, which is just you consider every possible ordering of the nodes from low to high, and you look for the one that has the smallest number of edges going down and the biggest number of edges going up. Now, in practice, that's actually a difficult calculation to do. There are an awful lot of different ways of ranking the node. Actually, there are n factorial ways of ranking the nodes, if there are n nodes. Uh, and that's a large number. Typically, we're looking at schools with hundreds of kids. So, you know, 200 factorial is a really big number. You couldn't look through all the possible rankings. So instead, you have to be a little bit clever about it. You have to look through them in a clever way, typically by doing a simulated annealing type calculation or something, which looks for good solutions without actually exhaustively looking through all of them. But you can certainly do that. And what happens when we do that is we find that there exist rankings of the nodes in the network that on average have 98% of the uh, directions going up and only 2% of them going down. And we've done that for many different schools. There are about 100 schools in this study. And uh, the variation in this figure is only about plus or minus 1%. So that's a pretty good thing. You can get almost all of the edges going up and very few of them going down. So indeed, there do appear to exist rankings uh, in these networks that have this property that almost all the directed edges are from a lower rank in two or higher ranks. A lower rank in saying they're friends with a higher rank in. Now, of course, when we made this conjecture, we didn't make it out of the blue. The way you do this stuff is you look at the data, you poke around the data, you sort of get an idea of something that might be go on, going on. Then you, so you then make a conjecture, and then you go and test that conjecture. And you go sort of back and forward until you get something that is probable. So the way you present this stuff is you say, oh, here was our idea, and then we looked at the nature, and hey, our idea was correct. But of course, in actual fact, the practical way one does science is you just go backwards and forwards, and you poke around the data until you find something that looks right. Mark, and this is what we have. Uh, yeah. You, when you say that the, there was this uh, survey and I page did, what was the way that you defined, when you define your friends, who is friends with you? You can like name them friends, you can name Right. So, the question. so the question is, when they did this survey, how exactly did they determine who were friends with whom? And the answer is, so they go into these schools, they circulate questionnaires, uh, and the questionnaires list the names of all of the other kids in the school, and you're asked to identify who are your friends. Okay. Uh, no, in this particular survey, they were li limited to a maximum of 10 friends that they could name, and you'll see uh, in a moment that that affects some of the results. But you, you're limited, the number of people you can name is limited to a maximum of 10. The number of people who can name you is unlimited. Everybody in the school right. can name you if they want to. So that means your, your number of outgoing connections is a maximum of 10, but your number of incoming connections is unlimited. Um, okay, so, so this way, this is sort of a reasonably convincing result, but it's not terribly satisfactory because it ignores all of the connections in the network that go both ways, which is about half of all of the data. And as we said, that half of the data can also tell you something about this ranking, because by hypothesis, if two friends each name each other, then we think their ranks are roughly similar. Well, again, that's a conjecture, but it's a conjecture that we can test against the data. So the actual calculation we did was a more complicated thing, in which we created a model uh, so the way this model works is you assume some ranking of the nodes and then you have some probability that a person will name another person as a friend depending on the difference between your two ranks. Okay. So if your rank is much lower than me, I'm, much un I'm unlikely to name you as a friend. If your rank is much higher than me, you're a really cool kid, then I'm much more likely to name you as a friend. So the difference between our ranks dictates the probability of a friendship. You can write down that probabilistic model and fit it to the network. I won't go through the math with this. We use something called an EM algorithm to do this, which involves maximizing this expected log likelihood here. And some interesting results come out of this. So the bottom line is, yes, you can find a ranking which has these, has these uh, behaviors, that, that there's a ranking of the kids from low to high, so that's the most one-way friendships go up, and most two-way friendships go across. They're between two kids which have roughly the same rank. So here's some examples of the kinds of things we see. Horizontal axis is the difference in rank between two kids in the school. And it's normalized here to run on a scale from minus 1 to 1. So the largest negative difference is minus 1, the largest positive difference is plus 1. 
And on the left here, you see uh, a histogram of uh, the number of friendships between kids with that rank difference. And the left one is the bi-directional friendships. Both of them say the other So what you see is a huge spike in the middle and nothing very much elsewhere. That's indicating that almost all pairs of kids who both name the other as a friend, their rank difference is close to zero. They almost always have about the same rank in this rank. That's sort of an interesting observation because, amongst other things, it implies that the, uh, the kids in the school must have a pretty good idea of what other people's rank is in order to become friends with them. Right? If you're only going to be friends with people about the same rank as you, then you have to be able to tell what people's rank is. Um, so apparently people are good at estimating that about other people. The one on the right shows the one-way friendships. And there you see an interesting thing. You again see a big spike around zero. In other words, there are a lot of one-way friendships between two people who do have about the same rank. But there's also this sort of tail that goes out here on the right, and that's friendships between uh, people of people saying they're friends with people of substantially higher rank. So there's really sort of two parts to this curve. There's the big spike in the middle, and there's this long tail out here. And notice the way this tail falls off as well. People are saying they're friends with other people who are modestly higher than them in rank, but not much higher. So in other words, people, you know, they're modest about their ambitions. I want to be friends with this kid who's a bit cooler than me, but I am not going to say I claim I'm friends with like the coolest kid in class because nobody's going to do it. Um, I think that this spike in the middle is interesting. What does that say? There are a lot of these one-way friendships between uh, people who have almost equal rank. Very similar to the spike that we saw over here. As I'll show you in a moment, there's some interesting statistical similarities between this spike and this spike, which make us think that they're really the same thing. But this one here sort of represents real friendships. Both people say they're friends. Maybe this spike here does as well, but only one of them says they're friends. Perhaps that's because, for some reason, we're missing the other half of the data. You know, they really are both friends with each other, but one of them didn't say so for some reason. Maybe the data are just inaccurate, but it could also be uh, an effect uh, of the limited number of friendships that you can claim. We just talked about a moment ago, you're allowed to claim a maximum of 10 friendships. <coughs> well, you know, maybe you ran out of your 10. You named your 10 best friends, you got, you know, you got 30 friends, while the other 20 just don't get named. So there may be some real friendships in there that just don't appear in the data, and that could be causing this play in the middle of the lake. Uh, so, our evidence for that kind of conjecture comes from noticing what happens when we look at schools of different sizes. When we look at schools of different sizes, it turns out that, so these are just the central spikes in the tube block without the tail. We've taken off the tail, we're just plotting the central spikes for lots of different schools. So the different blue curves here are lots of different schools. And they're all about the same width when we measure them in terms of sort of absolute rank difference. So this is now, you know, my rank is one, yours is two, yours is three, yours is four. Everybody's sort of one rank higher than the next version. Um, and then and the width of these central peaks is roughly constant when uh, measured in terms of that. In other words, within this central peak, people tend to be friends with people up to a few to the left of them and a few to the right of them. Um, and that's it. Uh, regardless of the size of the school. Doesn't matter what the size of the school is. These schools range from about 100 kids to about 2,000 or something like that. So there's a big range there, and yet the size of the central peak doesn't change very much. On the other hand, that tail that we saw to the right, of people claiming friendships with higher rank other people, uh, it does change with the size of the school. This is a plot of just the tails, uh, and now it's on this normalized rank difference that runs from minus 1 to plus 1. And on this scale, the tails are all roughly the same shape, which means actually they're changing shape with the size of the school. Because, because as the school gets larger, there are more and more people between minus 1 and 1. There's 100 people, or there's 2,000 people. So effectively means that the shape of the thing is getting wider. So these two parts of the curve scale in different ways. The middle peak stays the same, and the tails sort of scales with the size of the school. 
Um, what that's saying is that you're likely to claim sort of this real friendship, this two-way friendship, with people who are, you know, within, you know, the ten next coolest and ten next least cool people next to you in your part of the distribution, but you're likely to claim these one-way friendships with sort of anybody in the school. Doesn't matter how big a school it is. Um, so they're scaling, they're scaling in different ways, and for this reason we think that those central peaks, you know, they, they have something to do with each other. They both scale in the same way. Uh, whereas this tail in the distribution is maybe a, a separate kind of phenomenon for scaling in a different way. Question? Yeah, I was So the, the question is, uh, there seems to be a lot of variation in these data over here on the far end of the scale, and is that to do with the size of the schools, and, uh, uh, whether kids have different propensities, say, they're friends with the coolest kid in the class in different schools. Uh, I think the answer to that question is that most of the variation you're seeing there is just statistical variation. So uh, in general, you have very few data points on the end of the scale, because to get the maximum possible rank difference between two kids, one of them has to be the very lowest in ranks, and one of them has to be the very highest ranks. There's only one such pair of kids in any school. Whereas if you're talking about ranks that are quite close together, there are many pairs of kids all throughout the ranking that have that same rank difference. So in any one school, you get many measurements of closely similar ranks, but only one measurement of the most dissimilar ranks. So in other words, you're getting fewer and fewer data points as you go out towards the extremes of this curve, and then our fitting procedure just doesn't work so well. In those terms. So I think this variation out here is probably not real, I'm afraid to say. It's almost just so that it's just yeah. uh, it, There could, although this basically is zero down here. When, when you're fitting a small number of data points, you know, even if there's only a small number of them, if they're all zero, your fit is no, still zero. Fine, you have, you have very, even before you get to the experience, you see the variation. Over here? Well, yeah. Fair enough. It's, it's not impossible there is some signal there, but I think it'd be difficult to extract, and the main reason is because of just a lack of data. We just don't have enough data to say. So, um, so the hypothesis is that there is some connection between this ranking that we're pulling out of the networks and, and some sort of measure of status uh, within these schools, social status. Um, so as a way of testing that, uh, we looked at uh, some of the other characteristics of the students in these schools we don't have a lot of data about them, but we have, well, first of all, we have the network, so we can, for instance, work out their total popularity. How many people said you were their friend? So we know how popular, some measure of how popular uh, the students are, and it's widely believed that that should be correlated with status. Higher social status, more popular. So what we see in this case would be the in degree of your node in the network. In degree is the number of connections that are pointing to you in this network. We can measure that for each of the students, and then we can plot the rank of the students in this ranking calculation we've done against how many people said they were your friend. And what we find is very strong positive correlation. Uh, horizontal axis, how many people said they're your friend, vertical axis, your rank as extracted by this network analysis. And it appears there's, there's a strong positive correlation there that you're much likely, more likely to be higher ranked than lots of people say Conversely, there's a much weaker connection without degree. That's the number of people that you say you're friends with. And that makes sense, right? You don't get to be a popular person just by saying that you're friends with lots of people. If lots of people say they're friends with you, then you're popular. If you just say, oh yeah, I'm, I know lots of people, that's not necessarily make popular. So there's a much weaker correlation. Now, there is still a correlation with that degree, but it's weaker. Or, and we also measure total degree, which means in plus out, uh, how many people say they're your friends plus how many people you say you're friends with, 
that could be considered to be some measure of sort of total amount of social activity, how sociable a person you are, perhaps. Um, and that, that also is quite strongly positive to be part of that. Mark, um, probably you mentioned this, but I forgot that. How did you define rank? I thought you defined rank as uh, a number of uh, linked to, to, to you, number of in-degree to, uh, to, to uh, so, so, so no, rank is this thing that we derive by fitting this model okay. to the network. Okay. So you know, e every node in the network gets a rank, mm -hmm. which in this case is scale to run from 0 to 1. Mm -hmm. And the model says that your probability of having a connection should be a function of the difference of the ranks of the two people involved. Okay. And then we work out what choice of ranks and probabilities best fits that model to the data we see. In other words, you know, there are some choices of the parameters of the model which would fit the data really poorly, and there are other ones which would fit them really well, and using this so-called expectation maximization algorithm, we work out which is the best choice of parameters, and that gives you both the rankings and this probability function. So those are the rankings that we're using here. They're, they're derived, in other words, from the detailed structure of the network, and they take into account things like uh, people are less likely to claim friendship with someone whose rank is a long way away than somebody whose rank is different but nearby, and bidirectional friendships are most likely to be, to be between people with similar ranks and so forth. All of those go into the deduction of rankings. Um, this here, the in degree, is a much simpler measure. It's just how many people say they were your friends. It's just a measure of that. Uh, when you say of degree there, is it the same? Uh, uh, like you can name up to 10 people, but you're not necessarily. <coughs> What do you mean right. so you can name up to 10 people. You can only people. name up to 10 people, which is why this axis here only goes up to 10. But Many people can claim you as a friend, but actually only goes so up to 10. Some people would claim like one, two, I have two friends. Uh, oh, there are some people who claim less than 10, yes. There are some people who claim zero. Some people say, I don't have any friends, I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> and those were the coolest. Now, they, those may be the those coolest. They're, they're, prob they're probably the people who go on to become multimillionaires. Um, here's another sort of test of the same thing. This is just a plot of the average ranking of the kids as a function of school grade. So we had we had students all the way from seventh grade up to twelfth grade. So most of these actually were high school, junior high pairs of schools. So it's seventh and eighth grade as well as ninth and twelfth. And you see that in general. Uh, rank increases with grade, and this is another thing that's been commented on plenty before by sociologists, that uh, kids in higher grades tend to have higher social status by virtue of being older. Um, an interesting thing here is notice grades 8 and 9 are almost exactly equal in average rank. The grade 8 kids are uh, temporarily at least the oldest kids in the school, because they're the oldest kids in junior high, before they move up to being the youngest kids in high school. So you might expect them to have a slightly higher rank because of that, because they're the oldest kids in school, and maybe slightly lower when their ninth grade is now their bottom of the token pole again. So maybe that explains why eight is sort of bumped up a little bit relative to nine, and, and some uh, strength to this interpretation of rank here as being some social, social status. Uh, finally, here's just one picture of one of our networks to give you uh, an example of what's uh, happening here. So, the nodes in the network are the students in the school. Um, <coughs> edges represent who says that they're friends with whom. There are actually arrowheads on these edges. I don't know if you can see them from where you're sitting. And the colors of the nodes represent uh, who's in which grade. The whole network has been plotted with the vertical axis being ranked as deduced from this calculation. So the lowest rank is the bottom, the highest rank is the top. And you can see that there is a strong correlation there between age, i.e. grade, and rank. Uh, what's maybe less clear is the fact that most of these horizontal edges are the bidirectional ones. And most of the vertical edges are the ones that are going on only one way. And that, again, is because bidirectional friendships tend to be between kids who are similar. So this is an example of 
the kind of structure that can be hidden in network data that you can pull out by doing these kinds of calculations. This particular calculation um, uh, basically used statistical inference, used the Bayesian inference method, the expectation maximization algorithm, to pull the structure out of the network. That's one of the uh, areas of research that I'm working on at the moment is uh, statistical inference for network data. However, I want to spend most of uh, the time today uh, talking about another area that I've been working on, which is uh, spectral methods for uh, analyzing network data. And here I'm going to go back to talking about this idea of communities in networks. Uh, so uh, a community is just a clump of nodes in networks. Many of the networks we look at have this kind of structure, club here, club there, lots of connections within clubs, few connections between clubs. So this could be a group of friends, this could be another group of friends. And it's a tightly knit group, and most of them know each other, but then there's not very many connections between different groups. Uh, this is a common structure in many different kinds of networks, not just friendship networks. Uh, here is an example from a friendship network. This actually is another of the friendship networks from this uh, study that I talked about, the friendship networks in schools. Uh, and uh, in this particular school, you can see uh, that there is two big communities of nodes in the network, this pump over here and this pump over here. Um, and uh, this one turns out to be an interesting one. Jim Moody himself has done quite a lot of work on this. So it turns out in this particular case, uh, the black nodes in this network are the black kids in the school, and the white nodes are the white kids in the school. <coughs> this is a school where the split in communities is along the lines of race. This, this is something that uh, sociologists have studied for many years, but this is sort of an interesting visual depiction of this. And as I say, Jim Moody has written about this by solving this question. Uh, those are the gray nodes. So the question was, what about kids of other races, either black or white, and those are the gray nodes. Means that they were gray. primarily Asian and Hispanic kids in this particular Yes? So what seems interesting there is that those looking at it do not seem to have any particular greater tendency to be bridges than uh, anyone else. That most of yeah. the other race kids are also embedded very strongly. Yeah, I agree. They just seem to be sort of scattered around the whole network. I agree. Yeah. Uh, here's another example. Uh, not a social network now, or maybe a sort of functioning social network. This is from a network that was studied by Lana Adamick, who some of you may know, professor here at U of M in School of Information, and her colleague Natalie Glantz. Um, this was a study of uh, web blogs i.e. personal websites on which people post their opinions on some topic. Uh, these particular weblogs that they studied in this study were weblogs about U.S. politics. Uh, and the study was done around the time of the 2004 presidential election. The paper actually came out in 2005. Um, uh, they have conveniently color-coded the weblogs, blue on the left and red on the right, to represent left-leaning and right-leaning blogs, just determined by going and reading what's on the blog, human, human judgment. And what are the links? The links are web hyperlinks. This web page links to this other web page. You can click on this one, you can get to this other one. And, uh, and what you see again in this network is a very clear uh, division into two communities, a lot of blue blogs that are all linking to each other, a lot of red blogs that are all linking to each other, not very many links between a blue block and a red block. So there are many reasons why one might be interested in this kind of structure in the network. One might just be interested in, you know, what are these communities? In that particular case, they were um, you know, liberal and conservative communities in the blogging world. Um, in a social network, they might be communities of friends. In a metabolic <coughs> network, they might be functional modules in the network. There's, there's many reasons why you'd be intrinsically interested in these things. Another reason why people are interested in modules in networks is for visualization purposes. If you have a network like this, you may not really be able to see what's going on very well in the network. But if you color in the nodes according to what 
community they belong to, then you can break down sort of the structured network. You can even take that and make a sort of meta-network out of it, where there's one node here for each of the communities in the network, and you've depicted the pattern of connections between the communities, but not the structure within the community. So this gives you a way of coarse-graining a network, of stepping back and seeing the coarse structure of the network without worrying too much about the fine details. And then if you want to know what the fine details are, you can always zoom in on one of these communities and ask, show me the nodes that are inside this particular community. People have actually made browsers for networks, software that allows you to visualize large networks by doing exactly this kind of thing. So sort of plug it together and show me the big structure. If you want to know the small structure, you can zoom in on one portion of the network, shows you the small structure. You can even do this in several layers. You can have groups within groups within groups, and you can go on zooming in. So that you can get a visualization of the node that potentially has millions or even billions of <coughs> a network that has millions or billions of vertices in it. Um, so, so an interesting question is, how do we detect these modules? You give me some big network. Now, if it's reasonably small, maybe I can just pick them out like some of the networks that I showed you. But if it's a big one with millions of nodes in, then you can't do that. Um, so we're interested in uh, automated ways of breaking up big networks. <coughs> Rather than relying on somebody taking weeks to try and work out the communities in the network, we're going to feed it into our computer and it's going to break it up for us, find the communities and say, here's how you should be looking at this network. Well, one way to do that would be just to say, well, what I mean by a good community is a good community is something that has lots of connections within the community and not very many connections between the communities. So let me just look for groups that have lots of connections within communities. Um, so, in other words, let me consider all possible ways of breaking up this network into communities, and let me find one where as many as possible of the edges, the connections in the network, are within communities. Unfortunately, that's not a very good measure, because then it's easy to see that the trivial division of the network, where we put the whole thing in one community together, gets you the best answer. Because then you have 100% of your edges within groups and 0% of them between groups which is the best you can possibly hope for, but it's obviously not an interesting answer. That's just a trivial answer. So, uh, in work that I did with Michelle Gerwin some years back, we proposed an alternative approach to this, which is to say a good division of a network is not merely one in which there are a large number of edges within groups. It's one in which there are more edges within groups than we would expect on the basis of chance. In other words, if I were to take the particular division into net of the network into groups that you suggested, and then just randomize the positions of the edges in the network, would I get as many of them within groups as I see in the real network? Does a randomized network do as well as the real network? So this is a typical thing that a statistician would ask about this question. Are the number of edges within groups better than I would expect just on the basis of chance if it was just a random network? So this leads us to the, this idea of modularity. Modularity is a measure of when you have a good division of a network into groups, and it's just defined to be, you give me a network and a division of that network into groups, I count up the number of edges within the groups, and then I randomize the positions of the edges and I count again. And to find modularity would be the number of edges within groups minus the expected number in the randomized network. In order to define this properly, I have to say how I'm going to do the randomization. In other words, I need a null model that makes which I'm comparing. Various null models have been used. The most common one is something called the configuration model, which is a model where you preserve the number of connections that each node in the network has, the so-called degree of the node, but otherwise randomize everything else. That turns out to be a good idea, because it turns out the degrees of nodes play a big role in the way networks behave. So preserving the degrees is an important thing if you're going to do this calculation. Mark? Yes. I noticed in your earlier thing that you actually indicated strengths when you had the modular thing with darker lines and thinner lines. That's true, right here. Yeah. Now, if you use the, the novel model that you are just talking about, <coughs> it looks like you could put weights in there, can you? You can, indeed. So the networks I'll be talking about don't have weights on them. And these weights here really are, they're not real weights. They're just a, an indication of how many different edges there were between this community and this community, just counted them up, right? So you could think of this thick edge here as actually being 10 different parallel edges. Really, that's all that's going on. However, there certainly are networks where we have some measure of the strength 
of connections. There are some connections that are stronger than others. You know, these two people are friends, but how, how much time do they actually spend together? You know, do they talk to each other for five minutes once a week, or do they see each other every day? You know, so, so you could have some measure of the strength. And absolutely, the me methods I'm talking about can be very straightforwardly generalized to cases where you have varying strengths. But in particular cases, I'll be talking about we have. Um, so given this measure here, there is some elegant uh, matrix formulation, formulation of this, this modularity method, which works as follows. The two things I need are what are the actual number of connections and what are the expected number of connections after I randomize them. Well, the actual number of connections uh, in, in a network is given by something called the adjacency matrix. That's the matrix whose elements A, I, J are 1 if there is an edge between node I and node J and 0 otherwise. So I'm numbering all the nodes. If there are n nodes, I number them from 1 to n. And the I, J element of A, I, of the adjacency matrix tells me if there's a connection between those two or not. Then I also need the expected number of connections between two nodes when I randomize things. So I randomize things, and an edge falls between these two nodes. Randomize the game, this time no edge fell between those two nodes. Randomize the game, an edge did. I do this many times. On average, how often does an edge fall between these two nodes? On average, 10% of the time, an edge fell between these two nodes, the other 90% of the time it did. That's the number I call PIJ, the expected number of edges between nodes I and J. The fraction of time when I randomize things, I get a connection between those two nodes. So now, Aij minus Pij is the actual minus expected number of edges between those two nodes. And then my modularity is just actual minus expected number of connections between every pair of nodes that are in the same group. Right? It's just number of connections within group minus expected number of connections within group. In other words, Take this difference here, actual minus expected, just sum it over all pairs of vertices that are in the same group. So I can do that by the following neat trick. And I'm going to here do the simplest possible case of this, where I consider uh, only two groups in my network. I can do more than two groups, but I'm going to consider the simplest case that there's only two groups to be. So I can, recommend, I can represent two groups in a network by this variable of S sub i. So variable S sub i is plus 1 if, if, if node i belongs to group 1, and it's minus 1 if it belongs to group 2. So this is uh, what we would call an Ising spin in the physics community. It's something which is plus 1 up if I'm in this group, minus 1 down if I'm in the other group. And every node has one of these things. It's either up or down, saying whether I'm in this group or this other group. So now these variables have the neat property that uh, uh, if I have two, two nodes in the same group, I've got two plus ones and two minus ones. Multiply them together, I get plus one either way. But if they're in different groups, I've got a plus one and a minus one, either this way or that way. Multiply those together, and I get minus one either way. So the product of two of these variables tells me whether I'm in the same group or different groups. <coughs> that allows me, with a bit of algebra, to write an expression for my modularity which takes the following form. Uh, uninteresting, boring constant out front, and here is just the total number of edges in the network, which is a constant, times this quadratic form. S is a vector of n elements which has the numbers Si down it, the plus or minus ones for each node, and B is a matrix whose elements are just these things here that I defined before, the adjacency matrix minus the expected value of the adjacency matrix once I round them. Both of these are things that I know, so if you give me a network, I can tell you what this matrix is. So now, here mathematically is the problem we're solving. You give me a network, in other words, you give me a matrix B. I want to find the maximum value of this Q thing, this modularity, put the largest number of edges within groups. In other words, I want to find the value of this vector that maximizes this whole expression once you give me B. So it nicely separates the structure of the network from the division of that network into groups. The structure is represented by the matrix B. The division is represented by the, the vector S. I want to find the S that maximizes this point. And you divide in two groups and you, you keep doing that, so... So, so we could, to do more than one group, we could certainly divide it into two groups and then divide the two into further groups and keep on doing this. Absolutely. That is one way to tackle the problem of doing more than two groups. Um, so it turns out that this is not an easy optimization problem. Actually, it's provably an NP complete optimization problem. Actually, it's NP hard. It's provably NP hard. Meaning, it's a really difficult problem. Computationally, 
you're not going to be able to do this exactly. But you can do it approximately and pretty well by the following trick. It's a fairly standard trick. It's called a relaxation method. So we want to maximize Q with respect to this vertex, at this vector S, whose elements are plus or minus 1. That's a hard problem. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to relax the elements of S and say they can take any real value. Not just the discrete plus or minus 1 now. They can take any value you like. Now it becomes a really easy problem, because if I've got continuous variables, I can do maximization just by differentiating. Just differentiate with respect to s, set it equal to 0, and I get my answer. And it turns out if I do that, the answer is that s, the vector I want, should be an eigenvector of the matrix B that you gave. Actually, it should be the leading eigenvector, so the one associated with the largest possible eigenvalue. So that's an easy calculation. I can program my computer to calculate that thing. That gives me a vector s which is not quite the thing I want, because I did this relaxation thing. I said that elements of S could be any real number. But really, I need them to be plus or minus 1. So what I get out of this calculation is a bunch of real numbers, and now I'm going to make an approximation by saying I'm going to round each of those off to plus or minus 1. This is not necessarily the right thing to do. There's an approximation involved here. So this result here gives me the true optimum of the relaxed problem. The optimum of the unrelaxed problem I'm going to approximate by rounding off the, pro the optimum of the relaxed problem. Not necessarily giving me the perfect answer, but in fact it turns out to be quite well. What that means, in fact, is just, you know, if I'm going to round a bunch of real numbers to plus or minus one, the nearest to plus or minus one, that just means the positive ones go to plus one and the negative ones go to minus one. So in actual fact, at the end of it all, the method you've got is extremely simple. You just calculate this leading eigenvector, and the positive elements, that's one group, and the negative elements, that's the other group. So you just go through all the elements in turn, assigning the corresponding vertex to one group or the other group, depending on the sign of the element. So the derivation may take a little while, but the actual algorithm is all one line. It's really just look at the sign of the elements and divide the thing as two groups. It turns out that it worked quite nicely. Here's a little fake example I made to illustrate this. So I just created a network that had two groups, just put more connections within the groups and fewer connections between the groups, fed it into the algorithm. There's the network. These are the elements of the eigenvector. And you can see there's a bunch of negative ones and there's a bunch of positive ones. And you split them at zero, put this half in that group, that half in that group, and you very nicely get the two groups that I buried there in the network. It seems to be doing the right thing. Apply it to some real networks. It also does reasonable things. Here's uh, here's a fun network. This comes from some work that I did with a uh, marine biologist called David Rousseau some years ago. This is an animal social network. It's a social network of dolphins. In fact, bottlenose dolphins in this case. Uh, so, so David spent several years bobbing around in boats in Doubtful Sound, New Zealand, watching this particular pod of dolphins. There are 62 of them in this pod of dolphins. Uh, and, uh, and it's an interesting story. While he was watching the dolphins, one of them disappeared. It's the one represented by this electronic here and there. And when it did, the whole pod of dolphins split up into two different parts. One part went off on their own. They didn't talk to the other part. So apparently, this dolphin here was the glue that was holding everything together. Don't know where it went. It wasn't dead because it came back a couple of years later. For a couple of years, it sort of walked about. And when it did, the group split in two. When it came back, they joined back together again. <laughs> well, so the fun thing is, David is able to extract the social network of the dolphins from his observations. So dolphins, apparently, are quite sociable creatures. They form friendships, meaning you know a particular pair of dolphins would hang around together a lot. So if you're you, a professional and you can recognize individual dolphins easily and you observe them for long enough, you can work out which pairs of dolphins are hanging out with each other. You can construct networks such as this one of which dolphins are friends with each other. And it turns out that if you just take that friendship network, the friendship network measured before the split happened, and you feed it into the algorithm I just described, it says split the network down the middle there where that dash line is. The actual split of the real network in real life is represented by the red and the green in this picture. The red circles and the green squares. So, so I didn't get it perfectly right, but it did a pretty good job. And remember, it's working with data that were measured before the split happened. So in a sense, it's predicting what is going to happen after the triangle off in there disappears. Here's another sort of similar example. 
This is a famous social network from the social networks literature. Um, uh, so this shows a friendship network amongst uh, students at a university club. It's actually a karate club, a club where students go to practice their karate at their university. And it's famously referred to as the Karate Club Network. And it comes from a study by a guy called Wayne Zachary in the 1970s. He spent a couple of years studying friendship patterns within this particular group of 34 students. And again, it's an interesting case because while he was studying them, a dispute arose within the club, it was actually about whether to raise the fees of the club or not. And as a result, the network split into two parts. Half of the, the students went off to form their own club. So again, what we did is we took the friendship network from Zachary's original study, uh, fed it into the method that I described earlier, and it splits it into two halves along that dotted line down the middle. The circles and the squares indicate the real split of the network in real life. And in this case, it's got it perfectly correct. Again, the network was measured before the split in real life happened. So you're taking data from earlier and using it to predict the things that was going to happen. There's another interesting uh, side to this, which is, which is revealed by the different shades of the vertices here from light to dark. So what I've done here is I'm looking not really at the signs of the elements of the eigenvector in this calculation, but also their magnitude. So if you think about it, if I were to take this network and change it a little bit, you know, move an edge here, erase an node there, just make some very small change, that's going to change those numbers in that eigenvector a bit. Probably not very much. If it's a small perturbation, it'll only change them a little bit. But they'll be sort of randomized a little, those numbers in the eigenvector. So if your number in the eigenvector, the one that corresponds to your node, is very close to zero, and I do that, I make some small changes in the network, it could potentially change your number a little bit, plus or minus, enough to flip it over from one side of zero to the other. Instead of being positive, now you're negative. Instead of being negative, now you're positive. That means you get put in the other group. In other words, if your number is very close to zero, then you're not very firmly in the group that you're put in. A small change to the network could have put you in the other group. So we can't conclude very strongly that you're in one group or the other if your number is close to zero. On the other hand, if your number is very far away from zero, then perturbing it a little bit isn't going to make any difference. You're not going to change the sign of that number by just moving it a little bit. So the magnitude of the elements tells you something as well as the sign. It'll, it tells you sort of how strongly you belong to the group that the algorithm puts you in. If one's close to zero, yeah, it's a bit dubious. Could be one or the other. Once further away from zero, they're definitely in the group you put them in. So that's what the shades represent here. I've shaded them from lightest to darkest depending on the strength and the gray ones in the middle are the ones that are sort of close to zero and they go on the way. And what you see when you look at it is there are sort of central members of each group which are very firmly in that group. And then particularly along this dividing line, this border here, uh, there are a lot of gray ones in the middle that can kind of go either way. It's a sort of gray area. Exactly what you expect. It seems to be saying something sensible, but it's nice to see that it can pick out not only who belongs to what group, but sort of how strong it is they belong to each group. Here's a, another example of that. This is kind of a neat network that was put together by my friend Baldus Krebs. Um, this, is, this is again to do with politics. This is a network of uh, books about US politics. Again, these are books from around the time of the 2004 presidential election. That's the one between George W. Bush and John Kerry. Um, and again, they're conveniently color-coded blue on the left, left, left leaning box, and red on the right. Uh, right-leaning books, and a small number of purple ones in the middle, which are sort of centrist books. And what do the connections represent in uh, this network? They represent frequent co-purchasing in the online bookseller Amazon.com. So if you ever bought a book from Amazon, you go to Amazon, you look up a book, it'll say, people who bought this book also bought these other books. Uh, so what that's telling you is that there were a lot of people who bought this particular pen. So what all this did in constructing this network is he just went and looked at all of these books, about 100 of them, he went and looked them all up on Amazon and looked at which ones were co-purchased with each other ones. And that's what the edges, the connections represent in this network. There, Amazon says people who bought this book also bought this book. And what you're supposed to get from looking at this picture is that a lot of connections between blue books and a lot of connections between red books and there are very few connections between blue and red books. Very few people are buying both the blue books and the red books. 
So that suggests that if we take this network and we feed it into our algorithm, we should be able to pick out the communities of blue books and red books, even without knowing anything about politics or about the content of the books. And indeed, that turns out to be the case. You can pick out two broad communities. Here they are. And not only that, but you can, by looking at the values in the in the leading eigenvalue, in the leading eigenvector, you can say which one most strongly <coughs> belong to their different communities. So there are very blue books, and there are very red books, and then there are a bunch of sort of purplish books, which are somewhere along, along the board. So you can actually make a, a sort of a impartial judgment here about which are blue books and which are red books, rather than the, the original judgment, which is made by you know reading the books or reading something about them, making a a value judgment based on some summary of the book. Yeah? So what there's a good point about that that the hypothesis is that it's striking to me that there's a real difference you would see a sort of polarization between this and the product club network. That the product club network, actually the three individuals who are all physically the most strongly associated with one group or the other all actually have connections that cross into the other cluster. But if you look here, none of these strongly red or blue books that I can see have any connections at all across the uh, center line. Yeah, so I think that's true. I don't think that... Uh, I don't think that makes a huge difference. And the, the thing to notice about this network is that the most central individuals, these two over here and this one here, are also the ones with the largest number of connections. So yes, they have connections on the other side, but that may be probably just because they kind of know everybody. But the vast majority of their connections are within their own group. So if one looked at this as a percentage type thing, then yes, they have connections, but it's only a small fraction of the total possible connections. Different from the case of, say, this node here, which only has three connections, one of them is to the other group. That's two-thirds of that person's total connections to the other group. That's going to put them in the gray area in the middle, but they're not clearly in one group or the other. Whereas this person here, despite the fact they have these two connections to the other group, still the majority of them are mixed. So you're absolutely right, but I don't know that it makes a huge difference. Um, so I just wanted to finish up. I, I should finish soon. Right? Uh, I've been going for almost an hour. So I just wanted to finish up by telling you, I'm going to skip some of this stuff, and telling you some new, recent results from work that I've done with Raj Rao, um, uh, in which we looked into how well can we expect this method to work. So we're asking the question, if I know what the communities are in the network, can I detect them using this network? And to do that, we set up a control test where we make fake networks with communities in. In other words, we computer-generated synthetic networks, not real social networks, just ones that we made up to have specific communities in. And the way we do that is, is to use something called a stochastic plot model. We divide nodes into groups, and then we have a higher probability P in of connections between nodes within a group than P out connections between nodes in different groups. So we put down the connections at random, but with higher probability in groups than between groups. And in the simplest case, again, we can just do this for two different groups. The nice thing is, it turns out that in this case, we can calculate the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix B exactly for this particular random network, and it has an interesting structure. Most of the eigenvalues fall in one big band, which has this sort of semicircular structure here. This is the famous Wigner semicircle law that you may be familiar with if you know anything about random matrix theory. And then there is one additional eigenvalue out here, outside the band. This is the one that we're looking at when we ask what are the communities in this network. We're looking at the leading eigenvector. So it's the one associated with this leading eigenvalue, perhaps like that. And we can calculate all of the properties of these things. We can calculate the star at the end of the band, the shape of the band, the position of this extra eigenvalue. And this is the one that we're interested in. This is the one that tells us about uh, the communities in the network. Now, these parameters, C in, C out, are just related to the P in and P out that are defined on the previous transparency by a factor of N, where N is the number of nodes in the network. So they're basically just the same thing. They've been rescaled by one factor of the size of the network. So now an interesting thing happens. If I change the strength of 
the communities in this network by varying p in relative to p out. Well, if I made p in and p out equal to each other, so that the probability of connections within groups was the same as the probability of connections between groups, then there would be no communities in the network anymore at all. There would be no, no way of telling that the communities were there. If I do that, this eigenvalue here disappears, and I just have the semicircle spectrum. And that's expected. It's well known that in just a uniform network with no structure in it, you just get the semicircle spectrum. So I can recognize the difference between a network that has communities in it and one that doesn't by whether it has this extra eigenvalue out here. Right? If that's not there, then I have no communities. If that is there, then I do have so one could say that the presence of this eigenvalue here constitutes detection of the community. I see that eigenvalue, that tells me that the community is in the network. So here's the interesting thing. If I vary C in and C out, the position of this eigenvalue here varies. If I make them closer to one another, so the community structure is weaker, then it moves closer to the edge of the band here, and eventually, at some point, it disappears into the band and you don't see it. Anymore. So the interesting thing is, the point at which it does that is not the point at which there's no communities. It happens before that. Yes, this one does disappear if I set C in exactly equal to C out, but actually there's an earlier point. You can calculate where it is. I can calculate when is this equal to that. And there is an earlier point at which it disappears in the band. And at that point, I only have the semicircle. There's no evidence left that there's any communities in the network. But there are communities in the network. They haven't yet disappeared. They're still there. I know they're there because I put them there. But there's no evidence in the spectrum that they're actually there. What's more, we can show, I won't go through this calculation, but we can show by considering the structure of the Eigen vector as well, that our ability to detect those communities vanishes exactly at that point. Here's how successful we are at detecting communities, and as we make C in and C out more and more equal to each other, it goes down and down and down, and there is a sharp phase transition at which our ability to detect these communities goes to zero. And it's exactly that point where the eigenvalue disappears into the continuous band of the spectrum. In other words, there is a phase transition in the behavior of this algorithm. If I make the community structure weaker, there is a point at which I lose my ability to detect that commu those communities. Um, that point is not the point at which there are no communities. There is such a point, but this is not it. The communities are still there, and I know they're there because I put them there. To say that another way, if I gave you this network and I told you where the communities were, then you could confirm that I'm right. You could go in and you could measure the average probability of connections between members of the same community and the average probability of connections between members of different communities, and you could confirm, with high statistical likelihood, that one of those numbers is much higher than the other. So if I told you what the answer is, you can confirm that my answer is right. But if I don't tell you what the answer is, you can't find it. So there is this regime, so there's a regime over here where you can find the answer easily. The method I told you about works. You know, dolphins, karate club, whatever, it'll work. You'll get the right answer. Then there's the regime over here where there's structure in the network, but you can't find it. If I tell you where it is, you can confirm that I'm right. But if I don't, you can't find it. Well, if you're a computer scientist, this may sound a bit familiar to you. It's kind of similar to this whole P versus NP thing. Have you heard about this? So, in the, so there's this concept in computer science of P versus NP. Algorithms in P are ones where I can find the answer quickly and I can verify the answer quickly. Algorithms in NP are ones where I can verify the answer quickly if you tell me what it is, but I cannot find it. That's exactly the situation that we're seeing here. And indeed, it seems likely that, they're, that these are basically the same thing, that that's exactly what we're seeing here. What we're seeing, this transition we're seeing in this spectral algorithm, is precisely a transition between a regime in which you can find the answer quickly and verify it, and one way you can verify it quickly, but you cannot find it in this computational sense. So there's, it's a very nice recent work by a number of different groups, by Zohar Nasanov and by uh, Aurelian de Staal, and uh, on looking at this from a sort of more computational point of view using methods of statistical physics, like the cavity method and belief propagation, uh, which indicates that, in fact, that is precisely what is going on here, that you have a transition between a P regime and an NP regime, and a phase transition between the two, where it becomes computational. This is sort of interesting from a practical point of view as well as a philosophical point of view, and I'll just end with this last comment. Uh, 
Suppose I had a, a network in the real world and it had some structure in it. And suppose I was in this regime where the structure is weak enough that no algorithm exists that can detect it, or at least not in polynomial time. In other words, it's going to take the lifetime of the universe for my computer to plow through the algorithm and detect the structure. It can only be done in non polynomial time. Well, now suppose I have some real process in the real world, be it a sociological process, you know, internet packets, or some web process, any process you like, running on this network, in other words, taking place on this network. If the outcome of that process depended on the fact that you have these communities in the network, then that would constitute detection of the communities. Right? We would effectively have an algorithm that detects communities because you would run whatever this process was in the real world, and its outcome would go this way if there's communities there, and that way if there are no communities there, you'd have a detector for communities. And then, in principle, you'd have a computer algorithm algorithm that can detect communities as well. Because you could write a simulation of whatever that social process is or something and run that on the computer instead of being in the real world. And now the outcome of that will tell you whether there are communities there. But we've said that that's not possible. Right? It's not possible that there exists an algorithm that can detect these communities. So that tells you that there must be no process in the real world whose outcome depends on the fact that you have this structure in the well, if there's no process that depends on the fact that you have a structure in the network, then why do we even care about it? Right? If it can't actually physically have any effect on any result on anything that you care about, then we don't care about it being there for. So we're in an interesting situation where it's telling you that you know, effectively we don't care about the structure of the network. There's a whole regime there where the structure is present but undetectable, but effectively we don't care about it because it can never have any effect on anything that we measure in the real world. We're only interested in this regime over here, and that regime is the regime in which our algorithms work and everything's fine, and we can do the calculation. So it's actually the opposite of the case that physicists often uh, care about, where they're interested in finding good ways of solving the hard problems. Computer scientists also often working in this regime. Can I come up with some approximation algorithm that gives good results to the hard problems? This is a case where we're only interested in the easy problems, because the hard problems simply can't have any effect in so we're always working over here in this easy regime, which means that things like the spectral algorithm should work. I'm out of time here. I will stop talking now. Before I do, I just want to say thanks to my terrific collaborators. This work was done with Brian Ball, his current uh, grad student in the physics department here. Michelle Berman, a previous student who worked with me some years ago, now a tenured professor at the University of Maryland, and Raj Rao, who is a professor in the uh, EECS department here, electrical engineering. Uh, Raj is an interesting guy. He works on signal processing. That's his thing. You might not think that had anything to do with networks, but it turns out there's a close mathematical connection between signal processing and detecting signals and this detecting community structure in networks. They don't look like the same problem, but it turns out mathematically they're very similar, so we've been able to take some of the methods that he's developed for studying signal processing uh, in electrical engineering and applying them to detection of networks in uh, in detection of communities in networks, and that's uh, the last piece of work that I came that I talked about there came out of the work that I've done. So thanks to them, thanks to some people down at the bottom here who gave us money, thanks to you for listening. That's it for now. Any last questions? More here? I
food webs are robust to this and that because they are modular. Um, I think there is a bit of a disconnect from the question of how much structure, I mean, are these good modular? Uh, so it's not the question do we have modularity, but how do the models, the network, the, the modularity is? And I was wondering if you can comment on this. Um. Okay, well, so a couple of different things. First of all, uh, in addition to telling you what the best division of network into modules is, in some sense, this method can also tell you how good that division is, because not in, as well as calculating where the maximum modularity falls, you also get whatever the value is of the maximum modularity. If that's higher, then your community structure is stronger, and so it gives you some measure <coughs> of how strong the structure is, and if it's very weak, then indeed you may be correct that it doesn't have much predictive power for things that are going on in the standard. Um, uh, however, it's also true that we don't have a very good understanding of how this particular value, this so-called modularity, might relate to any particular process going on in the network. So you could ask a more specific question, the kind that you're talking about, of you know, sort of how much of the behavior does the structure that I'm detecting predict? Uh, this is more of a statistical question. To truly answer that question, one would have to have a mechanistic model that connects the structure to whatever process it is that you're interested in on the network. And so that is going to be a domain-specific study. It's got the, the mechanistic model is going to depend on the particular domain you're working in and the particular mechanism you're interested in. But one can say some more generic things. Um, one can come up with statistic, statistical models of community structure and say, how much does the best fit model in this class predict the structure of the network I'm looking at? In other words, how much additional information would you have to give me after telling me about the community structure in order to determine the entire structure of the whole network? This is something that people have worked on using some of minimum description length methods. So there's a certain amount of information that is stored in the structure of a network, the amount of information in terms of bits that I have to give you in order to specify the complete structure. And I can split that up into the amount of information I need to give you in order to specify the community structure, plus whatever's left over. And that whatever's left over is a measure of how good uh, the community structure determination is. It's a me measure of, you know, did I, once I've determined the community structure, does that tell me most about the network? Or is there lots of other stuff going on in there? So people have looked at those kinds of things. There's actually some nice work from a few years ago in PNAS by uh, Carl Bergstrom and Martin Rostar which I can recommend in that line if you're interested in that. But several people have worked on it. Just a quick uh, thing for comment. It looks like when you went from the one and zero to values, real values, uh, the problem you could use more standard methods to get at relaxation procedures. Uh, when I went from... Oh, when I did the relaxation? Yeah, 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 absolutely. So the relax problem is straightforward. To Which perhaps suggests that if you had strength of connection, things might go easier. Um, well, so that's possible. So, so when you have strength of connection, that's changing the values of the matrix B, but it's not relaxing the values of the... No, the it's not. S, which is still plus or minus one. So right but nonetheless, it is possible, depending on the spectrum of that matrix, that you could have a better optimum for a more generic matrix which has real value connections in it yeah. than one that has only the street value. Yes, that's it. The conjecture is that if you have some kind of evolutionary process where you're adding nodes to the network over time in some mechanistic way, that in fact, you may move out of this uh, unknown regime into the regimes where the modularity is more strongly defined. That's certainly possible indeed, absolutely. There are ways the network can evolve to make the community structure stronger than the other stream. Yeah, but our way in terms of if that, that increases the overall fitness in some sense. That could certainly happen. So yeah. See if, if we then merge, just you run this process and see if this one Yeah, so if I build an agent-based model, right. I might actually see this if the agent's going to be bottled. This class is... If you have strengths of connectors as well as... Uh, as well as just number of connections, then you have to start with the 
designing in terms yeah, of you know, also careful. when individuals have a greater amount of sort of total connection force than other individuals, to what extent is that likely to be reflected in stronger connections versus more connections? Yeah. You might think so, but in practice, actually, the null model is a very straightforward generalization of one that I talked about. Instead of the degrees, the number of connections each node has is appearing, it's the sum of the strengths of the connections of the edges connected to the node that takes the place in degree. And the total number of edges in the network becomes the sum of the strengths of all of the edges in the network. And you just take those numbers and substitute them in where you had degree and total number of edges previously, and you get the exactly equivalent null model. So it actually turns out to be a very straightforward generalization. I agree it's not necessarily entirely obvious why that's the correct one, but it mathematically turns out to be very straightforward. I guess that seems to be an under-generalization. Well, it's a sort of maximally random model in the configuration model sense. You could certainly make some more sophisticated model, but the goal here is to choose uh, a sort of maximally random model. You're randomizing the edges. So, so uh, in this case, you don't want a more sophisticated model. Yeah. You want this random. Any more questions? Thanks, Mark, again.